right, welcome everybody to the fifth episode of Ears of the Canvas. This is Ryan Truland. I really can't wait to get into today's episode. We have our first fighter on the podcast today, uh, Joe Selecki, who is 1-0 in the UFC, is kind enough to join us. But before I get into his introduction, just want to remind everybody that Ear to the Canvas can be found on YouTube. So go listen on YouTube. We have four episodes up there right now. Uh, please subscribe if you enjoy what you're hearing. Um, nothing but good things ahead. More fighters coming up. Uh, so today, Joe Selecki, like I said, he's 1-0 in the UFC. He was undefeated in the amateur ranks. Then he went pro, had a 7-2 pro record. He, You might have seen him on Dana White's Contender Series. That was back in July of 2019. He won in the first round via submission. Impressive enough to earn a contract from Dana White. And then he made his UFC debut against Matt Wyman. That was in December of last year on the Overeem Rosenstrike card. Um, he won that via decision. I know he's eager to get back in there and show the world what he can do. He's been working hard. He's kind enough to take, on, take the time out of his uh, busy schedule to join us. And I really hope you guys enjoy the episode. Hello. Oh, hey, what's going on, Joe? Hey, how's it going, Ryan? How are you, man? Awesome, man. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I know you're a busy guy. So let's get oh, right into it, Joe. Right on. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, man. So I know you're a New Jersey native, right? Uh, yes, I was born in New Jersey, but now I'm actually living in Wilmington, North Carolina. Okay, what part of Jersey? Uh, south, right outside of Philadelphia. So, like, uh, the closest decent-sized town was, like, Glassboro, near, like, Rowan University. Okay, but, uh, yeah. My town is called Winona, a real small town. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I'm uh, from Ocean County. I still live there. Okay, yeah, yeah. only thing I know about there is uh, that's where Tom the Blast's school is, right? That's right. I'm with, yeah. I'm from his town, Lacey. Oh, wow. Small, yeah, small world. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> so how'd you end up in North Carolina? Uh, so I actually went to college down in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, right outside of there. Uh, my okay. parents just were getting to that age where they wanted to get away from the hustle and bustle, and it made more sense for me to follow there and try and get into state tuition at, uh, in college, you know. And yep. then uh, life took weird turns. I ended up not finishing and uh, pursuing fighting, and then that just led me out of Myrtle Beach and just an hour and a half up the road to uh, where I live now in Wilmington. Wow, that's interesting. So what – Um, I know you're a BJJ black belt. Is uh, Did you start off with jiu-jitsu? Is that your first combat sport? Yeah, I started jiu-jitsu when I was six years old. Oh, wow. You've been doing – you're a lifer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, you know, all by chance because, you know, it was like 1999 when I started. So we really had no idea what we were doing, especially me being six. Um, but it just seemed like traditional martial arts. They're very similar because you're in the gi and, you know, there's structure and all that. So my parents weren't really sure – you know, you got to think if, if it's all coming from all the martial arts originate in Japan, right? And then it becomes, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu down the line. But the cultures are similar, the uniforms are similar. So they thought they were putting us in traditional martial arts. And I'm very, very lucky that they didn't know the difference because they probably wouldn't have wanted me in something so uh, hands on in contact at such a young age. But we kind of lucked out, my brother and I both. And uh, we both still train. And I took it to, you know, MMA. And he still trains at Brown Belt and Jiu Jitsu still. And uh, we just kind of became lifers. Wow. What, so when did you start competing? You started at six. Uh, yeah, my first tournament was uh, the Battle of the Beach. It was the first Battle of the Beach they ever had. Uh, Naga Battle of the Beach in Wildwood, New Jersey. So that oh. was 2000. Wow. And, and it was nothing like what the tournaments are like now. So now, you know, you go and you have your ring or, you know, it's a square, but they call it the ring. And uh, all the refs are in uniforms and nice scoreboards. And this was just... High school wrestling mats and a free for all. The rest were competing, so they had Valley Tudo shorts on, you know, the real tight shorts at the time, and maybe like a white beater or a tank top, just to, just to look presentable. But they didn't have even staff shirts back then. It was just like a free for all. It was unbelievable to see where tournaments were back then to now. Um, so it almost was really good because it was kind of scary as a kid, and now going into fights, it's like, well, at least. It's organized. We're wearing Reebok. Everything's nice and normal, and uh, it's regulated. But back then, it was like 
It was like the Wild West, I feel like. Yeah, seriously. All the way back early 2000s, I bet it was. Yeah. Joe, just give me one second. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I don't know if you were able to hear my TV turn on like, out of nowhere. <laughs> no, I didn't hear it, but right, no worries, cool. man. <laughs> so tell me, what, uh, tell me like what type of grind and dedication it took to get to where you started to where you are today. Is it just every day since you were six pretty much? Is it – what type of grind uh, yeah, is it? Pretty, yeah, pretty much. You know, I think every single year of my life it got a little more intense. You know, um, when you're six, you can only go as much as – you know, as much as healthy for a six-year-old, you know, and, and as much as your parents will bring you, you know. So uh, I was like three days a week, four days a week growing up. Um, once we switched to, you know, we started with uh, a guy named Jim Fortunato in uh, in New Jersey, in the town we lived in, and uh, he runs the Good Fight tournaments now. So that was uh, their big related to the tournaments. He does a great job with those. He was a great instructor. Um, his instructor was John Hassett, who then became my instructor when I was like eight years old. So um, at their school, we did both jiu-jitsu and traditional karate. So oh. kids' class was karate class, and then adult class was martial art, or, uh, was jiu-jitsu. So I would do each one twice a week. So four days a week I was training. And it was a really good balance, I think, for a kid because I had the carefree, you know, kind of breaking balls with each other at night with the adults where I was, you know, nine years old, hanging out with adults every night. But then also had the structure, discipline, and you know, line up and bowing and all that stuff of traditional martial arts, doing karate uh, twice a week with yeah. the kids. So it was a really good blend. And then as I got older and older, it became more of like, you know, trying to train. I never wrestled, and I really regret that I didn't, but I would watch college wrestling rooms, like documentaries and things, and try and emulate that. So I'd be going for runs at, you know, yeah. 6 a.m. before high school. And once I got my car, it was all, all bets were off. I was training every single day, um, I would drive into Philly to go to Team Balance headquarters on Sundays uh, to their open mats when I was like 16, 17. Uh, you know, we would hop in my car, myself and my two teammates who were younger than me. I was 17. There, uh, My buddy Andrew, who now trains at Team Alpha Male, and my other buddy John Battle, wow. who's a pretty big man in the jiu-jitsu scene. Um, you know, Andrew was like three years younger than me, so he was 14. John Battle was like 15, and I was 17. I was the oldest one. We'd drive to Virginia and go compete on the weekends and you know, kind of fib to our parents about where we were going. So it just became this obsessive pursuit of, I don't even know what we were pursuing. I don't think we thought about money or anything because we were teens. We just wanted to be the absolute best we could. You know, we'd come back and uh, report to our instructor, John Hassett, that Monday, how it went, show him the videos. And it was just this really cool, like you felt like you, you know, now it's kind of mainstream, which makes it even better because there's money to be made and DVDs and all that. But Back then, it was almost like you were just like, felt like you were part of this little thing that nobody knew about, even though people, even though people did. Yeah. And uh, it just felt special, you know? It was like, I didn't really fit in in high school a ton, or, you know, I wasn't bullied or anything like that too bad, you know? But it was just like, I felt like I found my niche and just wanted to run with it. And it never felt like work, and now it does feel like work sometimes, because of how hard we train. But even then, I, I love it so much. I'm with my friends, and uh, it is a grind, but man, I really think it's, I'm very, very lucky to be able to do this, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like from an early age, you took it upon yourself to really go after this goal. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like um, I always kind of said it to myself the same way. And then uh, especially as I got older and started fighting and stuff, I really repeated it to myself. I was like, this is my way out of a normal life, you know? Yeah. Nothing wrong with normal life, but um, I spent so many years just kind of blending in in school and blending in you know, we go to family parties. I had nothing to talk about, you know, with my, it's just because I'm, I'm one of the younger ones and I have 18 cousins. And it's just funny seeing from then to like yesterday, we had a call, a Zoom call for my grandfather's 84th birthday. And all my cousins are on their uncle's aunts and they're all asking about my fight and when I'm fighting again. <laughs> Everybody likes They have like fight team story, but... shirts on. <laughs> yeah, and I never wanted attention, but it was just a cool way for me to go. This is the avenue for me where I can stand out. You know, I'm not a very loud person. I'm not a very outgoing person. Uh, my brother's the funny one in our family, so I really don't have anything that sets me apart. And thought this is my way to maybe, you know, make a good life for myself, and my family, and hopefully influence some people for the positive along the way. You know? Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. So, once that. you got to the UFC, you fought your first fight was against Matt Wyman, right? The veteran Matt Wyman. Yes, sir. Well, I, I, I would like to know what it was like for you backstage about to head out for your U, first UFC fight. What was what were your feelings like back there? Uh, man, just 
a lot better than the Contender Series because the Contender Series was like a, it felt like somebody had a gun to my head. Okay, you know, yeah. Do or die. And even though my UFC debut is do or die, it was almost like, oh, wow, this is a bonus. I'm here. There's 10,000 people here, whatever it may be. But um, the actual debut was like a dream, man. It was just, it felt almost like foggy, hazy. Like, is this really happening? Because, you know, when I show up to this stuff on Fight Week, I almost feel like a, a 10-year-old kid still, <laughs> like, nerding out. Like, oh, that's Alistair Overeem. That's, uh, you know, whoever. And um, it was really, really cool. And I got to to do it in D.C., which is kind of halfway between here and home. Right. Um, so I had so many friends and family there. My wife was standing right over the railing. Wow. Uh, right where I was about to walk out. And looking up and seeing all these people, it means so much. And, um, it was just, it, it felt like, it almost felt like everything was going too right. You know, like, um, my grandfather got to come see me fight wow. for the first time since my first pro fight. My dad uh, came to my, that was the first time my father's ever seen me fight in person or on TV. Wow. And, uh, and just to, to, you know, having gone through all the doubt and the worry the families go through or friends or coaches, and to look up and see my name on that big screen as I'm about to walk out was just a very, very surreal experience. And it was all positive. There was no negative, which is kind of crazy because usually there's that voice of doubt. Yeah. It almost felt yeah. like there was just a bunch of hands pushing me to go and just let's do it because it doesn't get any better than this, you know? Yeah. Very, very different than what I was expecting. Wow. Well, and then you go out and have that dominant first round and go on to win that fight. That must have been a great feeling. Yeah, you know, it was unbelievable. Um, I really, really hated it that the end of the fight kind of got a little hairy with him getting upset. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it was such a positive thing, but it didn't, it didn't matter because I got to look up and see all my friends and family and, uh, and my coaches who had worked so, so hard to get me there. So, yeah, it was just a great, great experience. It really couldn't have gone any better. Maybe a finish would have been better, but I think kind of facing the whole – everyone's nervous to have that adrenaline dump of big fight jitters in the first fight in the UFC, and I got to go through three rounds with a little bit of an adrenaline dump and, you know, controlling it. Yeah. And I think that was really, really good for me in the long run. I think it will – you know, time will tell, but it definitely feels better. Yeah, I really admire people who can take that adrenaline and that nervousness and kind of fuel it to – turn into a positive and it sounds like you do that really well yeah absolutely man i think i think that's from my coaches too um you know jeff jimmo i I actually got to watch the fight back with common with uh where they showed the coaches between rounds and uh jeff jimmo our head coach has coached in the ufc like 30 times now yeah so he's just so good at keeping you focused giving you confidence and then on the other side of things my other coach john salter is an active fighter you know he's one of the best in the world in bellator right now uh, the middleweight yeah. division. So he's been there, done that. So when he says something to me like, I know you're having an adrenaline dump, shake it out, do this, you're like, oh, yeah, he's been here a million times. So, um, dude, I have these guys to lean on. It's been such a good experience just because I really don't have to do anything for myself other than listen to them. And if you can't listen to somebody, <laughs> then <laughs> yeah, that's you're on not you. Get you know? So far. they make it as easy <laughs> as possible. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, so you mentioned your wife and your family. What are, what are their thoughts on you fighting? What is, are they uh, – more nervous than you on fight night, you think? Uh, well, you know, it's funny. is I think my family, like my parents, um, you know, my mom can't watch, and I don't blame her. I would never want to see. You know, I'm about to be a father myself. Are you really? Months, Congratulations. Months, yeah, I'm having a daughter, so even more so. I love women's MMA, but I don't want to see my daughter. Yeah. Right, you know? <laughs> um, and I think my dad was more worried in the beginning about the career side of things because it's like being an actor, right. you know? If you're in the NF, if you're in football, as a young kid or in high school, you're already getting recruited. You already know your trajectory, you know. In MMA, it's like acting. you got to get a big break. Then when you get it, you got to capitalize and win that fight. Then you got to stay there. And I think they're worried about that and safety, you know. But as far as my wife goes, she'll tell you, uh, when people ask her, she says, once, once I'm in the cage, she's not nervous, which I think is amazing because I would be, you know, when I corner fights, I'm freaking out. Guys. <laughs> so uh, I can't believe the confidence she says she has in me. And uh, it's crazy. But I said it's funny with my wife because, we share a lot of uh, little, like, silent conversations when I'm in the cage, like, either, you know, waiting for the other guy to walk out or what may, what it may be. Like, on the Contender Series, obviously it's a small room, so we, I looked up, and she was freaking out for that because that's our future right yeah. there. And uh, I just gave her, like, a little nod and a little fist, like, and literally, I, in my mind, I'm going, oh, I got this, relax. And, like, literally, we were telling the story to our friends the other night, and she's going, yeah, you gave me a nod, you gave me a nod and a fist, and I, I could tell you, he was just saying, like, I got this, relax. <laughs> and I was like, it's so funny. And then we did the same thing in D.C. I looked up. She was in the nosebleeds, but I still looked up, saw her, and just like – so it's really interesting. Like, we kind of had this thing where we just trust each other, and 
Uh, we know it's going to be all right because we've been through a lot worse than losing a UFC yeah. fight, you know, as far as losing on the regional scene when, you know, there is no money coming home with you. There is no exposure. There is no – so that was a lot worse than anything, you know, at the very, very worst-case scenario, we're getting paid decently to go out there and fight, whereas on the regional scene, if you lose one fight, I lost yeah. two. You're worried about maybe never making it. So we've had a lot worse nights than walking out in front of 20,000 people to compete and maybe it not going your way and still getting a decent paycheck. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, we're just counting our blessings, man, and going to keep keep riding the wave until, until it's wow. over. Wow, that's almost like a romantic movie type, the uh, connection that it seems like you and your wife have. <laughs> <laughs> we, we really we went through all this. I've been through a couple different camps and stuff, uh, like training camp teams, and um, had some falling outs with some people and, you know, went through a time where even with my family, like we were, you know, they didn't really want to support this. And she's been the only constant yeah. really through it all that and a couple of really, really close friends. And uh, I really think it was the best thing for us because now it's, you know, uh, it's just, it's just really strengthened our bond. Like uh, I've heard, I heard Dustin Poirier say it about, about him and his wife as well. And it's the same thing as we could never recreate that. I could never recreate that with anybody else. You know, it's uh, you get a different bond when you're in the Fox yeah. Bowl, you know, and we've been in quite a few Fox yeah. Bowls together. So, uh, it's just a different, different dynamic. Yeah, those sure. are the one, the ones you want to hang on to, the ones that are with you through the mud. Yeah, yep. oh, 100%. Definitely. So that fight against Wyman, your first uh, UFC fight, that was back in December. Uh, when do you think we'll see you back? Man, I was really hoping May or June. Um, I put myself into a training camp about eight weeks ago because fights were rolling again and I was told to be ready. And yeah. I am ready. You know, I'm treating it like – like I had a fight eight weeks out and I just extended the camp, you know, so I'm doing all the same uh, fight conditionings I would do, all the same strength and conditioning, all the same sparring I would do if I was fighting uh, coming up in the next month or two. So it won't be a matter of being ready. It'll just be a matter of peaking, but I was told to be ready for June, for May actually, and then June and uh, going to do the same thing if June doesn't happen for July. Right. You know, it's the only balance would be walking that fine line of not being burnt out as far as physically, you know, mentally I'm fine, but uh, we'll make it work. So, Hopefully sooner than later, but we'll be ready. I think everything's on short notice right yeah. now. You know, even the top top guys, the headliners, are getting two, three weeks. So we're expecting that, but I'm in a camp. So uh, whenever they can use me, hopefully uh, we'll be Yeah, I was actually, point. that was going to be my next question. Uh, short notice fights are really prevalent right now with all the, with the uh, pandemic and whatnot. How comfortable are you with short notice fights? Have you done that in the past? Uh, no, I, well, I, you know, I, I've – same similar situations I've been in where like I was training for a date and then didn't get the opponent until, uh, you know, maybe two weeks out, three weeks out. So the same thing here. It's not, I, I wouldn't consider it a short notice fight for me personally, because I'm training right. in a camp. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm doing all the same workload. If I was out of shape or maybe I just been on vacation and got the call, then I'd be kind of panicked, you know, cause you worry about, am I going to have good legs in the, in the later rounds? Am I going to be, you know, mentally sharp? But with this, I think it's very level playing field because, Whoever I'm going to fight doesn't know they're fighting me either. So <laughs> just the opponents, the short notice part. So uh, that's the good thing about a jiu-jitsu background too is, you know, you travel, you show up, and you don't know who you're going against most of the time. So uh, that might play – I honestly, at this point, with the suspense and anxiety of, like, who are they going to give me, when's it going to be, I almost wish they'd just tell you to show up and you didn't know. That way I don't have time yeah. to worry about it. <laughs> so what do you what do you plan and what do you want to show the world next time you step into the octagon? Oh, I just want to show how much better I'm able to, to get between yeah. fights, you know, especially at my age. I feel like right now is the time in my career where every fight I can be a different fighter. Not changing my style, just changing, getting rid of all the fat and all the all the stuff in the way as far as movement, you know, sharpening up my punches, mm-hmm. my wrestling, my jiu-jitsu is going to get better. You know, I just want to show that uh, that was nowhere near the best fighter I can be. I'm nowhere near that fighter. So um, I just want to show what, what six, seven months, of time to improve can really, really do and time to focus. It's, you know, it's been awesome to see the fights after this quarantine and how sharp guys have come yeah. out of it. So I just want to be a continuation of that and show what uh, a couple months of forced, you know, self-focus can really, right. really do. Uh, and you're still such a young guy, only 26. Yeah, that's the thing is, like, I got to take this time to almost be thankful. You know, I, obviously I want to fight as often as possible. That's just in my nature, especially financially. We all want to fight. But – a time like this where I got seven months between fights almost, and, uh, you know, we don't want to stretch too thin, but at the same time, in seven months, I can come back a new person because I'm nowhere near my prime, you know, whereas 
maybe later in your career you're only getting better in small increments. But for me, I'm still learning a lot about about fighting, how to put it all together, and um, you know things that you're going, man, why didn't this make sense to me six months ago? So uh, yeah, I think time off is almost a blessing because it wasn't time off. I was working on all yeah. Weaknesses. So um, what it, what would you say the main focus of your training is right now? Is it just all around, or is it heavy? more skew towards striking, more towards wrestling? Well, it's going to be, it's going to be balanced most of the time. Uh-huh. We try to be, you know, but in each, I'd say in each area of MMA, I, I have a specific focus, you know, cause I'm going to do the same amount of sessions on each discipline, no matter what, which is a little bit uh-huh. of everything every day. But, you know, in my wrestling, I'm focusing on certain things in my striking. I'm focusing on, you know, really sitting down on my punches, making it count when I land and staying in good structure because, you know, in the past you get excited and I, uh, maybe open up too reckless or was moving around too much instead of just, you know, standing my ground. So just little things like that, but uh, focusing on the game as a whole. And then I think the most important thing is putting it together. Cause I know I'm never going to be the best at any of these, you know, uh, I like to think I have great jujitsu, but you know, there's guys like Gilbert Burns out there who are multi-time mm-hmm. world champions. You know, you can't just trade yeah. jujitsu that guy. I didn't wrestle in college. I didn't, you know, I've never been to Thailand for months <laughs> on end, but I think I could be the guy that puts it all together. And can, you know, maybe take somebody out of their shoes. They're thinking I'm wrestling when I'm striking, vice versa. Same thing on the ground, you know. So I, I just want to be able to put them all together and, uh, you know, just be able to fight at a ridiculous pace to, you know, go out there and have a relentless sense of urgency every time I fight and yeah. put it on. Yeah, yeah. no, a lot of uh, – some of the fighters I've been able to talk to, a lot of them have said that guys that are all around that are dangerous no matter where the fight goes are guys you don't want to fight. It was all around guys. A hundred percent. That's the best way to put it is I just want to have as few gaping yeah. holes as possible. You know, I, I want to be able to look at a guy and say, oh man, he's a lifelong striker. He's a Anderson Silva type. Well, cool. Exactly. We're going to put him on his butt, you know, or, oh, he's, he's a collegiate wrestler. Good. I just got to be able to get up and let my hands go. Or, you know, I just want to, I want to be able to edge everybody out anywhere I need to. And I think that's just coming with time. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Great um, so real quick, we'll circle back to your family. I just wanted to ask you, um, how important do you think it is to have that strong support system that backing you and believing in you? Oh, man, I, I think it's tremendous. I think, um, you know, it's easy to push yourself when everything's going good. But when everything's going bad, it's, it's really easy to start second-guessing yourself or doubting yourself. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty driven. But if it wasn't me, it was, I was you know, if it, was, if it was just me, it's easy to keep driving forward. But when you have people you feel responsible for, sometimes you almost have to stop and be like, am I being irresponsible by yeah. doing this? You know, especially where we were at in life is, you know, I had moved to train full time, was working some odd jobs, but nothing, nothing substantial. And, you know, after a loss or two was really feeling like, am I, you know, doing a disservice to my wife, you know, and um, having those people to push me has been tremendous. There's people, like my boxing coach has been another one, man. He's a two time cancer wow. survivor. And, uh, yeah, at one point in his life, he, he couldn't walk anymore because of, you know, he had bone marrow transplant. They put him on experimental medicine. It made him paralyzed. It was just an incredible story. And um, somebody like that telling you, not, no, don't quit. I've seen this. You have your whole life to go do this and get a job or and everything goes, you know. People like that, it, then you can't stop because these people are investing so much time in you. So um, when things got hairy after my second loss and I really felt like I was letting everybody down, my wife, my boxing coach, my head coach, everybody was just behind me to let me know that I yeah. need to keep going, you know, and that was uh, when you don't believe in yourself and people still believe in you, it almost tricks you into believing in yourself, so I think it's absolutely important. Yeah, so you, you've mentioned that second loss a couple of times. It's crazy how small the margin of error is in mixed martial arts, isn't it? Oh, it's it's absolutely tremendous, yeah, it's because uh, in that fight specifically, uh, you know, I had just moved to where I train now full-time, and we uprooted our life, you know, and it was the best camp I had ever had. My wrestling had really improved, I felt, because of my yep. coach, John Salter. And uh, I had the two best rounds I think I've ever fought up to that point. And then came out in the third, shot a sloppy takedown, kind of, you know, had that adrenaline dump of, oh, there's four minutes left and I'm stuck on the feet getting walked down. Yeah. You know, the last thing I remember hearing is, is, is John Salter saying, move your feet, we got to move up the cage. And then I was out, you know, and... uh it's just crazy. There's no room yes. for error, like you said. Uh, everything yeah. can change in an instant. You go from riding high thinking you're coasting out to a win, and 
Uh, that's exactly what you can't do. It's coast, you know, and that and that's exactly. You back off the gas pedal for one minute. And yeah. Well, all changed. you can do is learn from those, right? Oh, 100 percent, absolutely. I think about those two losses every single day, and I think that's a that's a good thing. You know, some people call it obsessive, but uh, I'm not here to have peace of mind. I'm here right. to work hard. And those two right. losses made me work hard. All right, let's uh. Before we wrap things up, I just want to ask you a few questions that aren't related to fighting. Um, so yeah, we're finally getting some nice weather up here in Jersey. I'm sure you guys have had some nice weather down in uh, North Carolina. Yeah. I was curious, what's your favorite backyard barbecue game? Oh, we're really getting into spike ball right now. What was it called? Uh, oh, okay. That's spike pretty ball? new, right? Yeah, yeah, with the net in the middle, you got four players, yeah. you're bouncing the ball off. Uh, that gets super heated. If you take a bunch of guys that train together and you play, it gets very intense. We're dying <laughs> all over, and uh, that is that is a blast. Yeah, on the beach, or in the backyard for a barbecue. Yeah, we've been having some serious, serious uh, battles awesome. with that. And it's been a blast. You play cornhole? That's my favorite one. Yeah, I'm not terribly good at cornhole. <laughs> I'm like a <laughs> three out of ten, you know, so I have to – I had to check my ego before it starts and go, you're probably not going to win. And that's really hard for me. I'm super competitive, but I've kind of come to terms with the fact that i got to play that just for fun because I'm not very good. All right. And now I see all the time on social media, your social media, uh, you posting about your dogs. Can you tell me about them? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. They uh, they are full of personality. I've got a, uh, a German wire hair pointer. So he's a... a Purebred, thoroughbred, uh, they're bred for hunting. If you go to the airport, you'll see them a lot for as police dogs. They sniff for uh, narcotics and bombs. And he literally is the exact opposite of that. Uh, he naps about, gosh, probably 19 hours a day, 20 hours a day. He's sleeping and just fat and lazy, missing all his teeth. They usually have great teeth. Like they're show dogs. It's unbelievable, the difference. And we found him in the shelter through my uh, – Two of my old bosses, they were husband and wife, oh, and okay. a family. Two more people have just pretty much given me so much in my career. They would go to the shelter and walk the dogs. Uh, them and their kids would take out each dog for 15 minutes, and they found him, and he was going to be put down, they said. So uh, he was heartworn positive. So we went in. I was As soon as I saw him, done deal. Took him for half a walk. I was like, wow. we're going home together, buddy. And uh, gosh, we've had him for four years since. And then about a year after that, same people, my bosses, again, they found our other dog, Grace, they found her on the road seven Jeez. times. They kept returning her to this house, returning her, returning her. Yeah, very busy road and uh, very dangerous because she's a yeah. little black dog. So when Jesus. it's nighttime, you really can't see her. And uh, they finally, when they took her back, a lady screamed at my old boss and said, you know, stop bringing this dog back. It's not our effing dog. We hate dogs. We're renting the house. The owner of the house is in jail. They were, they were subleasing the house. So she said, all right, well, so I, yeah, I kept saying, I was like, I'm telling you, you keep finding that dog. We'll change your name to Grace. No one will ever know. She can have a great life. And then finally she called me. She's like, do you want this dog? I was like, I will be there. That's one of the only times I've ever skipped training. I left the gym to go pick her up. And I was like, Worth I'll it. be there in 15 minutes. They signed a paper. We took her. Yeah. And uh, that's been three years. And, man, they are just – you can just almost feel like – Yeah, they're, that's they're really commendable. People, you know? and it's crazy, man. We love them so much. Yeah, now – now uh, they're obsessed with my wife because she's got a big old belly with uh, a baby now. And they, they they didn't know for a while, and now they definitely know. They follow her around. Yeah, they got that stomach, sense. So. <laughs> Family's getting bigger, man. Yeah, it's pretty awesome to see, man. They're, they're awesome. Uh, they really are, and especially right there. now with the uh, – or the, it's opening up a little now. But with the quarantine, it was it's really nice to have a dog or a couple dogs at home. Keep you company. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dude, you're never alone. You know, they're always sitting there with yeah. you. Yeah, and every time you walk through the door, it's like you won the Super Bowl. <laughs> that's yeah that's what i said about uh i posted for you know my dog mix i saw that the yeah pointer, the one we had first i was like i've come home <laughs> from wins losses we were living in my mother-in-law's guest room when we got him he didn't care you know then we moved to a really crappy crappy apartment in a not good neighborhood then moved to a crappy <laughs> apartment in another crappy neighborhood oh. never cared now we live in a little better spot he still doesn't care, you know. Like it's just like uh, yeah, absolutely. Best friend for sure. Unconditional love for sure. Um, so what's your favorite type of music, Joe? You like all music or? Oh man, right right now, currently now that I'm in North Carolina, it's like contagious. Oh really? I really like country. Um, I didn't oh, really? used to. I used to not 
I always change the station, but uh, we like a guy uh, specifically. My wife and I really like uh, this guy Drake White. He's uh-huh. a really good. He's like kind of bluesy, and uh, we've seen him in concert a couple times. And we really, really like him. Luke Combs, uh, Eric Church, stuff like that. Awesome. That's, that's kind of what I'm. What do you for like? Right uh, what what type of music do you walk out to usually? Is there a uh... So I walk out to uh, Machine Gun oh, okay. Kelly, a song called like Running. And uh, I really like him too. I like his music a lot, like specifically like yeah. when I'm training or on the way to training. But uh, that song specifically, you almost hear a song sometimes, you're like, I feel like this guy <laughs> yeah. wrote this for me. And I've uh, been walking out to it ever since. I think I've walked out to it probably every oh, single really? pro fight in most of my That's pretty cool. All right, yeah. Joe. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I can't thank you enough for coming on, man. Oh, yeah, man, I wish I really you nothing, you nothing but the best in the future. All right, Thanks I'll so much, uh, keep really in touch. All right. All right, let me just take a quick break to tell you guys about our sponsor, Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's an app available to download on your computer, iPhone, or Android, and it's the easiest way to make a podcast. For starters, it's free. Everything's free on Anchor, and it gives you all kinds of tools that allow you to record and edit and create your very own podcast right from your computer or phone. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, man, how do I get my podcast out to the people? Well, Anchor even distributes your podcast on all the biggest platforms such as Spotify and Apple Music. You can even profit from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Anchor is everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Go download the free Anchor app, or go to anchor.fm to get started today. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was Joe Selecki. I hope you guys enjoyed our conversation. Great guy, so easy to talk to. Uh, you can tell how driven he is, how motivated he is to just be the best at the best that he can be at his craft. He's been working for a long time. You can just tell there's nothing but good things on the horizon for Joe Selecki. Um, again, I couldn't thank him enough for coming on. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I got a couple more interviews coming this week, so stay tuned. Make sure to subscribe to Ear to the Canvas and. Much appreciated. Stay healthy, stay safe.